explore the wisdom of the revered Narada Bhakti Sutras, a cornerstone of Hindu devotion. With His Holiness Swami Jyotirmayananda, experience 45 enlightening lessons on the essence of Bhakti Yoga. Discover the path to pure love for God and transcend the material world. Embrace the teachings that have guided devotees for centuries. Attain spiritual perfection through devotion. Prepare to understand the depths of divine love. Find your path to spiritual enlightenment. Trust in the sutras. Follow these instructions. Be blessed with devotion. And now, His Holiness Swami Jyotirmayananda. Vasudev Sutam Devam Kanshachanur Mardanam Devki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum Adorations to Lord Krishna, the preceptor of the universe, destroyer of the forces of darkness, bestower of immortality. I'm going to give you the essence of Narada Bhakti Sutras in series of talks. The study of Bhakti Yoga, as you understand, is very vital for any spiritual progress. There are four yogas. Jnana Yoga requires intellectual movement, inquiry, study of scriptures, and trying to understand who am I. Jnana Yoga means practice of meditation. Go into all the details about how mind can be focused and stay focused. Karma Yoga, path of action. How to do your duties with perfect spiritual insight. All four Yogas, they are interrelated. To reiterate, you have in your personality four aspects: reasoning, always inquiring, consider it like your head, your heart aspect, feeling, your hand aspect, actions, and for meditation, consider it throat. You have to have the health of all, all these in order to be a healthy personality. This is what we know as integral yoga. At the same time, you should know that people have their choices. You can consider any particular yoga as a highlight of your sadhana. So you can adopt Jnana Yoga always opening your mind to the study of scriptures, following the rational process of understanding who am I, the difference between the absolute self and the world of Maya. But you must know that in order to sustain your wisdom and sustain the progress of your Inquiry, inquiry process, your heart must be well advanced, well cultured. If you hold within your heart narrow mindedness, quick to be angry, quick to be cruel, unforgiving, and your, if your emotions are not under control, Jnana will become dry. Srimad Bhagavata gives a, an interesting parable. Narada, as he was coursing through different parts of the world, he met a lady. Before her, there were two persons lying down, grown up persons. And Narada comes to the lady and says, what's the problem? The 
he says, I am in Bhakti, and these are my sons. He is Jnana, and this one is Vairagya. They were just young, but now they become old, and they are fading away. I have I've been also become old, but now I'm re rejuvenating myself by turning my mind to Krishna. And Narada gives the advice that the story of of Krishna, the story of Bhagavat Purana deals with the glory of Krishna. If that becomes available, then all the three will flourish. Bhakti and her sons will become youthful again. Jnana will be bright and Vairagya will not be superficial, profound. The moral of this story is that all yogas are interrelated. You may not highlight it, but you shouldn't become too limited by it. I'm the Jnana Yogi, so you go on doing your bhakti. <laughs> or I'm Bhakti Yogi. I don't listen to all those big talks. The only thing I know is love of God. This type of talking is narrow mind. So, if bhakti is pursued in a right way, in all other aspects, jnana will become much more bright. Your meditation will be more profound and your actions will be much more qualitative. Each yoga enriches the others. Karma yoga, for example, you are doing good actions. If you learn the art of how to put your energy into right type of, right expression through activity, that will enhance your emotion, devotion. It will enable you to have more meditation and it will give you clarity of intellect. Try to just experiment. One day do things recklessly. <laughs> Next day do it very precisely. So by the end of the day you don't feel that you have left anything undone. And then see what your mind does. Mind has much more clarity. So all these four yogas are interrelated. If you Progress in any one of the four, you are progressing in a parallel manner in other yogas as well. But you have every possibility of, you have all, your choice, you have all the freedom to highlight one yoga in your life. And you can pursue it, become a jnani and go on pursuing it more and more. And become a bhakta and go on pursuing it. That again is based on previous experiences in past lives. So led by a spiritual process that operated in your past lives, you may find yourself either more interested in karma, highlight karma yoga in yourself, or highlight devotion meditation in yourself, or bhakti or jnana. more in an idealistic manner, try to understand integral yoga. That has been always the message of all the scriptures. That's the central theme of the Gita. Krishna doesn't leave any, any of the four. He gives the importance of all the four, Dhyana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, all. Having said all that, now we get into Narada Bhakti Sutras. Just like we have in Raja Yoga, Patanjali Raja Yoga Sutras. These sutras are believed to have been composed by sage Narada. 
फर्स्ट सूत्र से अथा तो भक्ति व्याख्याश्याम अथा तो नाउ दे आर फोर ऑल दी सूत्र दे आर सप्लीमेंटेड बाई लॉट ऑफ कमेंट्रीज हियर आई एम गोइंग टू गिव यू ओनली दी प्रेसाइज एसेंशियल अदरवाइज यू रीड इन दी बुक नाउ दे आर फोर विल कवर a big volume <laughs> the sutras are profound thoughts threaded together so each profound thought when you begin to unravel there are lots of things involved for example just to give you now you must realize now is the most important time in your life not past not future therefore all the past you have passed through how long you don't know millions and trillions of years and you are still where you are <laughs> still you are wandering in the world for the fulfillment of love how many things how many people who have loved through many lives how many relatives you have you had how many winters you have spent by the far side with large family and all how many times you all this has happened again and again and still your heart is empty to love and to be loved that's the instinct in every individual and you are looking for it trying to fulfill that instinct in every embodiment if you don't follow the process rightly then you go on repeating the same and so to to be brief solution lies in discovering that by loving god the instinct to love will be absolutely fulfilled because all people that they live and they shine they do it by the glory by the rays of god so god is the one who is shining through every person so when i love you love your child you love your husband love your daughter love you you are going after the sparks and where do the sparks spring from god the mind unable to understand what you who are you loving undergoes goes through lot of turmoil frustration ecstasy all types of things joy and sorrow so the spark cannot be confined into the body all personalities are transient and therefore mind that has not been enlightened begins to create the sankalpa the will may i have better karma may i have better situation in the next birth and goes on until you understand that deep down who you want to love is god himself another instinct in every individual to be loved to feel that someone loves me most and the answer again is god once the two fold instinct is directed towards god you are on the right path until then you move on through many many embodiments so that is the explanation of therefore <laughs> <laughs> and the solution bhakti devotion that's what we are going to explain
that Narada says. Now, the second sutra defines it. Satvasmin param prema rupa. Bhakti is of the nature of supreme love in the divine self. When your love is not directed towards anyone, anything in the realm of time and space, but focused on God, the transcendent, you must realize that implies that if you love God, you have loved all in the most profound way. The idea should not enter the mind that I must turn away from all types of love in my life and find God somewhere in the Himalayas, up in the caves. That may be adopted for a transient, for a short period, just like a person is sick, he goes to hospital. But that is not the healthy, something that can be maintained for always. The idea is to learn that in every relation you are loving God. Human beings are not just body and nervous system. In every individual there dwells God. Siyaram mein sab jag jani karo pranam jori jug paani, Tulsidhar ji says, knowing that Sita and Rama dwell in all heart, I fold my hands to all. It's high ideal. So then, your mind begins to focus on God in every experience of tenderness, love, affection, compassion, your mind turns to God. And you don't become attached to people, you become attached to God. Just like each time good news comes from the through your phone, you don't get attached to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> attached to the source. That's all the bhakti implies. Therefore, automatically the quality of your love towards relatives and others is extremely enhanced. Because you are not loving people for their external characteristics. You can therefore have patience to bear with different situations of body and mind because you are loving God. Therefore, love of God is the basis, source of all progress and prosperity, subjectively for an individual and externally for the whole society. You must realize God to the masses. God is not viewed in a correct way. God is viewed as awesome personality. Not everybody, I'm talking about people in all religions have developed a kind of abnormal concept of God. There are people sometimes, the moment they hear the congregation, they are talking about God, they'll <laughs> go away to somewhere else. <laughs> God has become a symbol of someone who can punish, thrash, awesome, not lovable. He demands love by force. And that's, that's not real. The real understanding is totally different. God is infinite love, infinite tenderness, infinite compassion. More than millions of mothers, more than millions of fathers. All this again, figurative. Bhakti is of the nature of supreme love. 
and that love directed to the divine self. Amrit Swarupacha, third sutra says, it is of the nature of nectar, nectar of immortality. Attainment of supreme love is same as revelation of the Self. The innermost Self in you is absolute love. Atmanastu kamaya sarvam priyam bhavati. All things become dear because of the sake of the Self. Even when you don't know what the Self is. <laughs> Even in a, in a limited state of mind, instinctively you love those things that somehow relate to the Self. You look at a house, there is a fire burning. So go on, it's a nice scene. Someone says, it is your house. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's a different matter. <laughs> Children are playing, you are coming from a distance, having toured somewhere, and they are playing, they are muddy, and you look to your car, say, oh, these are wild children. But then someone points out, one of your <laughs> sons are there. <laughs> <laughs> so everything in this world becomes so important, when the Self is associated with it. When you dissociate, disassociate the concept of Self, then you no longer you have any good feeling towards objects, towards anything. If you pursue that, that's a Jnana Yoga, the subject of study, Rasovaisaha, that Atman is pure nectar. Absolute nectar. Now, let me explain the concept of nectar. Whenever we talk of nectar, your mind conjures up a, a vessel filled with liquid, and that's how the Puranas describe. Ocean was churned and nectar arose out of it. And gods and demons both claimed it. But then God appeared in the form of enchantress, who enchanted the demons and gave them alcoholic drink. <laughs> to gods, she gave them pure nectar. In other words, this is a world where neg negative qualities in you are demons. Positive qualities of goodness, kindness, compassion, non-violence, they are divine. Divine qualities are favored. Nectar goes after them. Demonia qualities, they are maddened. Alcoholic drink is given to them. <laughs> And they are not immortal. So, negative qualities are going to die as long as you go on feeding the negative qualities by drugs and alcohols. They will survive. <laughs> but once you become more purified and move in a positive direction, they will die. But the divine qualities will never die. They have sipped nectar. I have given you now this elaborate description. What I am really trying to point out is, is the nectar liquid? And if you have a mathematical mind, can you figure out how much of that liquid will make you immortal? <laughs> now, following the definition of nectar as Upanishads present, it doesn't depend upon the quantity. If one drop sips in, in your tongue, goes into your tongue, you become immortal. 
another person may take a whole bucket. <laughs> it will make him better immortal. <laughs> the fact is, nectar is indivisible, is an abstract experience. An experience of whole is a revelation of the self. Can you split up the sky? So I can have one piece of the sky. People would have been owning it if that were so. <laughs> can you split up nectar? Bhakti is of the nature of nectar. So if you have bhakti, you are practicing it, that means you are developing, moving towards it. But when you actually attain bhakti, that means you and God have become one. And there, transience doesn't exist anymore. Death is gone forever. Death and destruction exist in the world of time and space. Where things happen, things move on. Here also you have to understand, going to a higher level. Deep within, whenever the deep within, you must understand, innermost reality. Your innermost reality is ever the same. It, it has no need to be enriched. But there is a reflected reality in your mind. That's to which you give the idea, this is me. That reflected reality will undergo changes. Let me give you another illustration. The sun up in the sky, a reflected sun in a jar of water. Each individual is like a reflected sun. The water is a mental process. Depending upon the quality of the mind, the reflected sun will be much happier state or much miserable, more miserable state. The reflected sun will undergo changes on the basis of the type of water. But all that has nothing to, to do with the real sun. In Vedantic terminology, this is called the process of becoming. Due to ignorance, you view yourself as an evolving soul. You are led by Maya through mental process. Every moment you become something different. If not every moment. What you are today, tomorrow you are not the same, one day older. You are constantly trying to become something else. All becomings are like projections on a screen. As you watch a cinema show, every moment things are changing. For the screen, there is no becoming. Similarly, you have twofold aspect within you. The jiva, the individual soul, qualified by the conditioned mind, constantly becoming led by karma. Brahman, the underlying reality, like the shining sun, ever the same. Realization means to understand that this individualized state is illusory. I am that. A revelation, I am the sun. That is the nectar. Once it enters your throat, immortal. Until then, the world will not give you any nectar. In the world of becoming, everything is conditioned. You read the history. People worked so hard, became a great personality began to rule a vast empire, millions glorified them. But then now we were digging into the earth to find what else they did, did they do. 
they all passed on. But if you have sipped nectar, you are no longer identified with body, it's no longer trapped in the world of Maya. You have the grandeur of I am Brahman. And that's, that's the nectar, Amrit Swarupa. Therefore, if you love God, it implies your ego begins to dissolve. Power of love dissolves the ego faster than power of knowledge. And that you can see in day-to-day -day life. Mother loves her child, she is self-effacing. The child is sinking in the... This is a crude illustration. The mother will jump into it, even without thinking, do I know the... <laughs> swimming. <laughs> <laughs> the instinct, love allows this ego to, to bend down, to be effaced. So therefore, when you practice bhakti in a right way, the practice of who am I becomes much easier. So that was the third, Amrit Swarupa. And to understand that that and that state of experiencing divine love is not in the form of quantity. It transcends the concept of quantity. It is indivisible attainment. Just like a sky cannot be broken up, nectar can't be divided into drops. Revelation of the Self cannot be split up. That now you will see only the nose of the Self. Yallabhva puman siddho bhavati, amrito bhavati, tripto bhavati. If you attain bhakti, means you have sipped the nectar of divine love, you become perfect. The world will not give you perfection. You will simply go on changing, become a historical personality, and come back and study your own history again and again. <laughs> That's not perfection. But if you have developed bhakti, you have become blended with God and absolute perfection. Next point, amrito bhavati. You don't live in a world of transience. The sky doesn't live in the world of transient clouds. The screen does not live in the world of projections. These are all similes. Similarly, you are not dependent upon the world of Maya. The world goes on changing. You are as detached as the sky is detached from clouds, as supportive as the sky is supportive of the clouds, as compassionate as the sky letting every cloud has, has its day, yet absolutely detached. Siddho bhavati, you become absolutely perfect. Amrito bhavati, you become deathless, there is no death, mortality, change. Tripto bhavati, absolutely content. Absolute Santosh. In Raju, in Vashishtha's four gatekeepers, serenity, contentment, Santosh, Satsang, good association, and spiritual inquiry. Santosh, contentment, is a profound quality. You are always striving to reach a state where your mind feels satisfied. Profound satisfaction. 
But all forms of satisfaction in the world have limitations. In Sanskrit, we use the term ankush, sankusha tripti. The world gives you satisfaction but keeps a little spear on your head. You work very hard and you are now in a position to enjoy your life. We have a lot of money. That's satisfaction. But look back, time. <laughs> time limit. Age limit. We have lots of garden flourishing with wonderful colors. But your eyes are giving way. <laughs> Your satisfaction is shifting. At least my children will see. <laughs> so all forms of satisfaction that you gain from the world is an ankush on that. <laughs> Not even ordinary string attached. <laughs> ankush attached. The satisfaction that arises, the fulfillment of all desires by that revelation, I am one, God and me are one, so hamas me, I am that. Devotional process starts with the idea, da so ham, I am an instrument in God's hand and you go on working with it, your feelings unfold become much more qualified until in the depth of divine feeling suddenly I slips away from you, becomes so hum. The da aspect slip, slips away from you, which means I am a slave, that slave idea slips away. There is nothing but Brahman. Sanskrit expressions Da soham means I am a slave. Soham, I am that. So what God does, you became too immersed in da soham. When you are not looking around, he obliterated da. <laughs> Your experience now, I am that. I alone have. Many interesting things are there, and I add them all up so that things don't stay too stiff. <laughs> and with this we conclude for tonight. Om Shanti 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 Thank you for joining us on this journey of spiritual growth. It's an honor to learn from the wisdom of Swami Jyotirmayananda. As we part for now, remember, the quest does not end. Take time to reflect on today's insights and integrate them into your life. Until next time, stay open, stay curious, stay present. The light within you is always shining.